Hello and welcome everyone to a new tier list video where in this one we will be going over every single visitable object on the land of your Samantha Major 3 Horn of the Abyss. So we're not going over the sea objectives, only the land ones. Um, also, this is my subjective tier list. You might like some things uh, due to other reasons than I do, um, and that's okay. We don't have to just uh, agree on everything. So um, here we go. Let's go over every single one. First up is we have the Abandoned Mine. In this object, you end up fighting um, a lot of troglodytes, some um, 100 at least, and then you get a random mine in return. It, this could be sulfur, anything. Um, no, not anything. It cannot be a sawmill. Anything, any mine but the sawmill. If you get gold, you're reasonably happy. If you get resource, you're okay. If you get ore, it's kind of meh. Um, also, it has a guard, so your sadios are not that easily able to take it. You will still have to chain Yami there. It's a pretty decent objective, but, you know, nothing special. Also, it's, like, pretty rare. You don't often see it. Um, a shame, because I feel like this is actually a pretty cool object. Mm, I would place it at B tier. Next up is we have the Alchemist Lab. Uh, the Alchemist Lab gives you one Mercury per day. It looks pretty cool, very thematic to, you know, what I would imagine Mercury to be... Uh, produce that. Um, this object is um, usually pretty easy to take and gives you your entire kingdom Mercury for weeks or months to come. Depends on how you play. <laughs> so, next up is we have one of the coolest objects in the game very early into the list. We have the Warrior's Tomb. This object, when visited, is gonna give you plus minus three morale for the next upcoming fight that you take. But uh, the good part is the um, you get a random artifact, and now it's a pretty low chance, but that the random artifact can even be a relic. So, like, this is an object that's, take, that's takeable in day one and can give you an earth dome, a teapot, angel wings. It can entirely make your game, and even if it doesn't roll that high, usually get something usable anyway. It's a very good objective, um, very interesting objective, very cool. Uh, very impactful. In many, many ways, I feel like you should always strive to pick up your Warrior's Tombs whenever you can. Next up is um, actually a combo with your Warrior's Tomb. Your Warrior's Tomb not, doesn't always give you a good arty. And you know what you do? If it's not a good arty, you alter sacrifice it. This object lets you sacrifice either army or artifacts into the alter sacrifice in order to get XP on a hero. This is a really good shortcut to build a good hero late into the game. Let's say you're main a mage, okay? And your mage is able to control the map quite well, it got you going, but it's uh, the late game and you need like a good, big, beefy guy to carry you through the late game and the final fight. You know, so you got like your level 1 Tazar or Giselle. And you want to get them XP real fast, real good. Um, then you sack all your unnecessary items from tops or whatnot, or just uh, that you picked up, uh, ones that you upgraded. Um, you get all of these in Talter Sacrifice, and you can build like a level 20 hero in a single day. Really good. Very impactful. By the way, the Altar Sacrifice can also be accessed by Cove's um, building, Grotto. So there's also another way to sack things. Also, not all the heroes can sacrifice artifacts, uh, some of them can only sacrifice army. This is based on your uh, hero's allegiance. They're either evil, neutral, or good. Mm, good and neutral can sacrifice um, Otis. Um, neutral and evil can sacrifice um, army. And neutral can do both, of course. Um, so yeah. A uh, really, really good thing, good object, uh, pretty high value whenever you're having a biome. It isn't, like, always useful, and it's not immediately useful, so I would put it at A tier instead of S tier. Next up is the Genie Lamp! One of the most impactful objects, okay? Um, let me tell you a short little story. Um, there's a template Jeepers Cross that people usually uh, play. It's a random template, and uh, it's a very simplistic one. Um, one that many, many people play, usually is their first template, and for some is their last template, because they live and die by Jeebus Cross. And in this template, Tower used to be really bad. Like, really bad. But then, they got introduced a genie lamp into their biomes, into their starting zones. 
and then they become like middle of the pack just through the addition of this item alone just sometimes getting this is already to push a faction to like new tiers above in power um by the way this object lets you recruit four to seven random genies at random and it's gonna disappear the moment that you recruit them it gives you insanely good tempo immediately after taking it it is very very good it costs a lot of gold but if you can manage your resources then this is always worth it super mega turbo objective there we go next up is the anti-magic garrison gate um this is usually seen in the campaigns and like uh, maps and this object really sucks actually Hmm, I mean, it's really hard to deal with, it's like, uh, not very intuitive, you just have to brawl things down, usually this, this is just, um, army check, you know, whether you're strong enough, it's not very intuitive, it's a pain in the ass, it goes in detail in my opinion. Next up is the, um, Coliseum, this gives you either plus two attack or plus two might to, I mean, plus two attack or plus two defense, uh, primary stat to visiting heroes. It's really good. Mm. So yeah. It doesn't cost anything. Like the school war. So it's better in that kind of way. And two my stats is actually not something to ignore. If you can get it early into the game. It feels really impactful. And even in the long run of a game. It can net you a lot of value. A really, really cool object. Um, very nice. It is at least 8 tier in my opinion. Next up, we have the Black Markets. Um, these are notoriously used for usually one purpose, okay? Very often into a game, you end up having two, like, usually your one piece off of a quest artifact. I mean, um, combination artifact. Uh, what this means is that you have, like, two Wizards World pieces, or three Armor of the Dam pieces, or two Elixir of Life pieces, and you just can't get that last piece. In that, in that case, uh, visiting black markets can often knit you that last piece. And for completing combo artists, they are really, really good. Apart from that, they don't really see much use. And, you know, things are pretty expensive. Usually more expensive than what they're worth. Unless you, like, really need a specific something. So, yeah. They're pretty okay. Uh, decent objects. In B tier, in my opinion. Next up is the Black Tower. Now, this is the... This is a Hoda, by the way, edition. Um, it wasn't around back in the Shadow of Death days. Um, in this object, you fight um, green to black dragon, depending on the size. And you always get like 2 to 3k gold as a reward on top of a small artifact. Really great objective, okay? The dragon usually requires some preparation, especially if it's like a bigger dragon. Um, green and red are usually pretty easy to do for almost anyone with like very minimal prep and to kill the black or gold dragon you have to do a little bit more prep but this is takeable really early on and this gives you like some good um, my party maybe boots of speed gloves they these can give you like really impactful great items at a small price of killing a dragon this is your core item for early gameplay on almost any faction super good thing um take it all the time it will get you going it will give you that early economy it will give you that early power it is amazing black towers in my opinion are s tier objectives they feel good to take uh they're not too easy they're not a pushover but still like really rewarding they're like what an object should be honestly they're the best next up is we have the simple border gate Inside of the anti magic one, these are a little bit more intuitive, but nobody likes border gates, so um, I would put them just a little bit above the anti magic one, since you know you can actually interact with them more, have more ways to actually go about them, and um, yeah, more options usually is good in my book, so they're a little bit higher. Next up is we have the border gate. Well, I call them the same thing. Um, anyway, this is a roadblock that usually requires you to visit a certain tent in order to be able to come across these. Um, these are ways in the, which, which makes you complete certain objects uh, or parts of the map before you can progress to the next part of the map. Um, they are very good in terms of building maps since they, you know, can keep players contained in areas that you want to be containing them at and then later releasing them into a new part of the map. Um, pretty decent for map building. 
they are not that interesting, but they fulfill a pretty necessary role, in my opinion. So there they are. Next up is we have the simple campfire. Uh, campfires are really, really cool. They give you some gold, they give you some resource. In general, they give you like 500 gold and like four, five of some resource. That's really good value. It's like a small gold pile and a full resource pile. That is definitely not to be underrated. It uh, goes in A tier, in my opinion. Mm, you should collect as many of these as you can throughout the game. You're going to be rich and you're going to be building mage guilds. You're going to be building your dragons, whatever you want to. Next up, we have the cannon yard. Now, cannon is really good, but it's not 4,000 gold kind of good. And it's not the kind of chain to an object kind of good. Um, this would be very nichely used. Um, you know, if you can get Jeremy with a cannon, you get a hero and you get the 4K plus and you get a hero that can actually use it well. Now, in that kind of case, it's absolutely bonkers. But in the case of Cannon Yard, I don't feel like it's usually worth either chaining two or even spending the 4K gold. If the map is rich enough that you can spend 4,000 gold, that's probably rich enough for you to get going in better ways than investing into a cannon. If the map is poor, then you can't really afford the 4K anyway. So it kind of falls flat in either of these scenarios making it pretty horrible. I would say it's not like the worst, but let's see them. Next up, we have the cartographers. Uh, first up is the uh, overground cartographer. For a mere 10,000 gold, you can get a, basically a grail from the wizard tower, which is nuts, ludicrously nuts. Reveals the entire map overground. Um, and that's really, really good. It cannot be overstated how overpowered this thing is. Uh, but when playing like campaign maps or AI maps, you know, 1v7 or whatnot, uh, the way that you enjoy it, it's usually pretty annoying in the sense that it makes the opponent's turns like pretty long. If you want to track everything, then it makes it annoying. It makes the game a little bit more boring to play. It's still super powerful. Um, and in most scenarios, it's actually banned. Um, either when you play PvP online, this is usually not an object that you will ever encounter unless you're playing Anarchy or some ridiculous wild format. Uh, anyway, if you were to interact with it, you should definitely pay that 10,000 gold. It's such a small price to pay. The uh, underground cartographer is quite a bit worse. Since uh, there's less content in underground per, like, per one map worth of map. <laughs> per one screen worth of map, there's going to be less interactable objects in the underground than in the overground. Meaning that the underground cartographer has quite a bit less value. And because of that, it is still super good, but it is a little bit worse. Oh, by the way, I think I should do this. There we go. This is far better. This is distinct between the two cartographers, but also, you know, they're super good. Next up is we have the churchyard. Now, this is uh, the churchyard has been nerfed a few times in one of the abyss. One, they have been made to not have uh, Walking Dead. Instead, now they have zombies. They are a little bit harder to kite, but they were still too easy to kite. So they ended up making the positions a little bit different of the zombies. So now you need some one stacks in order to set up your shooters to be able to abuse it easily. Anyway, if you have a power stack or one angel or... A, uh, a range power, uh, a range unit stack. You can take this pretty easily and you get a really good reward out of it. First off, the hero doing it is gonna get almost 2k XP. Second, you're gonna get 2.5k gold, which is nothing to scoff at in the early game. And also, you will be getting a potentially decent artifact. A modern artifact can give you plus 4 attack, plus 4 defense. Um, you know, you can get boots of speed, which is like the best item in the game, of course. Um, really good potential rewards, takeable almost on many factions immediately into the game, if you're skilled enough. Really good rewarding object, it is the bread and butter of most early game scenarios. Namely, over the Black Tower, it gives also experience on top of the other things. Um, it is very nice. Amazing object, always take. Next up is the Coliseum of the Magi. Gives you either plus two power or plus two knowledge based on your choice for free. Wow, really decent. Um, it can get your Tazar to be able to cast things uh, without actually getting any items. Um, it's pretty good. <coughs> Taking a few of these over the course of a game can get you pretty good value to uh, get your stats um, get your stats into like ridiculous degrees. Um, 
yeah, it's pretty decent. I like the subject. I usually visit it when I can. Um, it is a pretty good part of gameplay. I still feel like it's worse than the light version of this object. <coughs> Excuse me. Next up is we have the skeleton. Uh, this gives you a 20% chance to get uh, to give you a minor or treasure class artifact. So this gives you potentially the reward, the item part of the reward of a churchyard or a black tower. But these guys are there's many of them in stronghold biomes, and also they are free to collect. They're never guarded. So a side hero can go through a biome of stronghold and collect a bunch of small artists, which is really cool. Um. You can get your crowns of magi, your boots of speed, like you can get ridiculously good things from these and it, it comes almost at not no price. Well, price of movement points, but you're usually doing these on heroes that you don't really care of. You're using heroes of whose movement points you don't really care for. So yeah, pretty cheap item generator, not very consistent though, so beat them. But pretty cool object. I like these. When playing Stronghold, they feel pretty impactful, pretty nice. Next up is the Cover of Darkness. Uh, this object doesn't really spawn in PP matches, and it's not really that useful against the eye. Uh, but this object has one role only: is to fuck over the player in campaign. It's like, damn! I like discover the entire map and what's going on. I track the opponent's heroes and they visit the whole uh, the Cover of Darkness, and then I can't see anything anymore. I have to go back there, redo that part of the map. It's pretty annoying. I don't like it, uh, it's not very useful, it is there just to screw the player over. No, detail, in my opinion. Next up is the Crypt. Um, then again, I will say this again, uh, the same thing I said about the Black and Church, uh, Black Tower and Churchyard. This is the trifecta of early game gameplay of Heroes of Magic, Heroes of Mana Magic 3, sorry. Um, you do the crypts, the church arts, and the black towers. And the crypt is most uh, impactful of all. Because it is the easiest to take. And it can be potentially the most rewarding of all as well. Um, it's really, really good. You should learn to take these on almost any faction. If you do, your early game is going to be like far better. It's going to lead into better mid game, better late game. Um, these are super important. Despite being small objects, you should never underestimate them. And the power that they can pro provide to your kingdom. Very cool. Next up is the Crystal Cavern. Um, all the mines are going to be placed uh, pretty much together, at least for precious resources. So there it goes. It does the same thing as an alchemist lab. It looks pretty cool, has a wagon of crystals. Uh, so thematically, it's kind of nice. Um, I still like the look of the alchemist lab better, so I'm going to be slotting it slightly higher. Clearly, aesthetics should play a role as well. Uh, next up is the Cyclist Stockpile. Now, these are actually pretty weird. Um, you fight here 20 to 50 Cyclops, and based on how many Cyclops you kill, you're going to be getting plus to all resources, um, 4 to 10, based on how many you kill, of course. One Cyclops per stack equals one resource per stack. So if you're killing 50, you're killing 5 stacks of 10, meaning 10 of all resource. Um, it's actually pretty bad. Okay, you better hear me out here. It is bad, but necessary. Like, the uh, the hardness of a 50 Cyclops fight is actually pretty nuts. Even if you cover them, the Cyclops really just bash you with rocks, and it's not easy to take whatsoever. And the payout is not that great. However, this is one of the most effective ways <clears throat> to generate the resources in the later parts of the game. So, you know, you're building your mage guild, you need to research your spells in order to get the ones that you want, and that's not really that easy to do. In that case, you need the cycle stockpiles, despite them being harder than what they're worth. So by the time you overkill them, they're gonna be becoming pretty good for you. Um, they're pretty necessary, but not really interesting, and also overguarded. So in my opinion, they are beat there. There they go. Next up is we have the Den of Thieves. Now, this little thing is going to reveal everything that there is to know from the tavern. Um, the income, best unit, uh, kingdom army strength comparison, so on. It's It doesn't really do anything. It just gives you a little bit of information. But that information is usually very interesting to look at. So, I'm pretty happy when I see this in a PvP match, you know? I get a better understanding of what's really going on. A slightly better understanding of what's going on. So, it's not really that impactful, but I like it. 
visiting this usually feels pretty great. I sometimes even get a hero to sit here for like a few turns, especially in mirror matches, where you, you know, you're playing the same map as the opponent. If the opponent gets an angel, then you can actually guesstimate how big certain objects are in your zone, because, you know, the opponent's playing the same zone. So, can be, you can be pretty sneaky with this. Yeah, it's a pretty cool object. I like visiting this. So, it's not horrible despite it not doing much. Okay. Next up is we have the Wasteland version of the Windmill. Gives you 500 gold on the first week and 1000 gold on any following week. It's pretty good. Good income generator. Gives your side heroes something to actually do when they're no longer active in terms of doing chains. Uh, pretty decent. It keeps your economy afloat. I would put it even in A tier. Pretty cool. Next up is we have the Dragonfly Hive. The Dragonfly Hive, wow! What a core piece of the game. This is the first creature bank that we go over. In here, you fight 30 to 90 flies, dragonflies, and then you get 4 to 12 vibrants as a reward. Now, vibrants are not the best units, but if you get abundant amounts of a tier 6 unit, then it will most definitely be pretty good. And this is usually the core way that any game like kicks off into higher gear. You take one or two hives and then they will be able to do most of the other objects for you. They are really powerful, really good, a core piece of the game, um, especially PvP matches and they, their power cannot be underestimated. S tier, there they go. Amazing. Next up is the Dragon Utopia. What a cool object. You go into the lairs, I mean, into the mansion of the dragons, and then you fight a bunch, bunch of dragons, and you get, like, the best loot in the game, and ludicrous amounts of cash, okay? The moment that you take the first stop, you go from being a broke guy, barely getting by, to being able to splurge gold wherever you want. It feels so impactful to take this. And the moment that you get into the Utopias, the entire game dynamic switches. You go into the late game part of the map, and Utopia is the reason for that switch, usually. Best artifacts in the game, ludicrous amount of gold. Um, they're pretty hard to take, but they are worth it. Very rewarding, very cool. It all feels good to take one. Well, I mean, you can get bad rewards, but usually opening up a Utopia is still like a lot of fun, no matter what. They are one of the nicest objectives in the game. As there they go. Next up is the Dwarven Treasury. Um, if you're playing anything but on grass, you should go for these objects immediately. These have such good rewards. Now, the fact that you're fighting Dwarves is actually a part of the reward itself. So, you know, you start off with your level 1 hero in the uh, early game. You get your, like, your starting power stack, and you're like, hmm, what am I gonna do? And usually, your the answer should be a Dwarven Treasury. Because dwarves have a lot of HP, but they're really, really weak. Meaning that you can kill a lot of HP worth of units. And if you didn't know, for every single HP worth of units that you kill, you gain one experience. So killing a treasury worth of dwarves usually will net your hero a few levels in the early game. So this is a way to build resources, build your hero experience. It is really, really good. Um... Multi-purpose objective that ends up doing a lot for you. It is very much like the churchyard, but it can be bigger, basically. Mm, but that's gonna give you the item. I would put it in S tier as well. Really great object. Actually, I'll put it at the top of A tier, actually. Mm, yeah. Next up is the... Uh, experimental Workshop. And here you fight Steel Golems. New units from Horn of the Abyss. Um, back in the days, you actually used to fight Iron Golems, but Iron Golems were abusable in infinite damage scenarios, like any uh, speed 9 or above unit what, uh, that doesn't take retaliation would be able to kite them infinitely, and then you could cheese your way to having like 4 giants on day 1, uh, with like Lorelei, or maybe Conflict, Sprites, um, Inferno with Devils, and so on. Um, so that's why they introduced a new unit, the Steel Golem, which is faster, to take the role of the Iron Golem in the Experimental Workshop, so they are no longer able to be abused. And honestly, it's not a very good objective. It um, It's actually really strong, but they're one of the worst creature banks. Like, uh, the reward ratio for how hard of a fight you have to take, the actual what you get as an outcome is 
not that good. This fight is actually like pretty hard these days. The discarded few steel golems, you, they have like pretty good stats, and Giants' reward is not as good as some of the other options usually available. So because of this, I would put them low eight there. Now anything that's a creature bank is already gonna be like really really high, but to be low eight here as a creature bank, you kind of have to suck. <laughs> And Experimental, Experimental Workshop kind of does that. Next up is the Eye of the Magi. Um, this is an object that reveals the area around it when you visit the Seal's Hut. Mm, pretty good. It can give you like a little bit of a teaser for what's to come. Um, John, 666 Denver, um, guy in uh, pretty notorious in the whole lobby, usually may, uh, recently... Usually makes use of this in order to give you a better understanding of the map, in order to where you should go, what you should prioritize, gives you a bit of a teaser of the map, um, and it also makes the game a little bit more interactive because the, he places these eyes in the minds of players, so you actually get to see what your opponent is doing at least a little bit. Usually you can hide the things that you want to hide, but you can actually see the opponent actually in the map, and that is thematically really cool. It makes uh, the early game of Heroes 3, which is notoriously not very interactive with the opponent player, feel a little bit more interactive. It's a cool little little niche object that can be used to make the game a little bit more alive. And John recently did a pretty good job at doing this, so I like this object. There it goes. Uh, next up we have the Fairy Rings. Gives you a little bit of luck for the next battle. Luck is not that good, not very consistent at all. Usually not worth your moon points to go out of your way to collect. It is pretty bad. CT. Mm, Fountain of Luck. This gives you a random amount of luck. Minus 1 to plus 2. But once again, just because you add the uh, RNG to Fairy Rings does not really make it better. Luck is not a very good stat, not something that you should strive to collect. If you get some as, you know, while you're on the way somewhere, then it's okay, I'll pick it up. It might do something. If it doesn't, then, you know, whatever. That's the expected that outcome anyway. So, yeah. There it goes. But the Fountain of Youth, though. Wow, what an object. This gives you 400 moves to your hero and plus one luck or morale. I'm pretty sure it is luck. So yeah, the luck part is not really that good, but the fact that you get 400 moons is actually really amazing. And uh, whenever you're passing by one, if you have one on the road, then your heroes are going to be having far more moons. And that is nice. And also, if there's a um, Fountain of Youth next to a few fights, you can actually take a fight. Fountain of Youth, take a fight. Fountain of Youth. So you can actually even build movement points over the course of a few fights, it's very amazing. Um, it's pretty cool. I like them. Whenever they spawn in my volumes, I'm pretty happy to see these. Next up is we have the Freelancers Guild. In here you can send a cell army for resources or gold. They, it is almost never used, okay? They are potentially used in pre-nerf diplomacy scenario, so maybe like Clash of Dragons, where you have a notorious armies and, you know, maybe you want to upgrade your behemoth stack and change your behemoths, then you would sell, like, some other big stacks that you ended up deploying, and in that case, it's kind of good. But that's a very new scenario, not usually, not usually used in PvP, not usually used in PvE, so, yeah. Because of that, I would put them mostly there, with only minor utility available from these guys. Next up is the Garden of Revelations, plus one knowledge. A very simple object, but actually very impactful. Uh, first of all, these things spawn without a guard, meaning that you can pretty much take it immediately on any hero passing by. So that is one big plus. And also knowledge is far more important in the early game than power, because actually being able to cast the thing that you want to be casting is more important than it lasting maybe like one extra turn. Making this actually a very impactful object for most of the early hero building. I would say it's pretty good. I would say it's even 8th year. Wow. Mm hmm Next up is we have... Uh, what? Border gate. This is water border gate. This is normal border gate. Um, there it goes. Next to the other border gate. Uh, next up is we have the gazebo. <clears throat> the gazebo is... Um, 
an object that costs you 1000 gold but as a reward gives you 2k SP. Now, to get a hero from level 1 to level 3 you need exactly 2k SP. And this gives you that. So immediately just visiting this thing alone is going to knit you a level 3 hero from a level 1. Pretty good. Um, for early complex gameplay, since the spawn is in complex biomes, it's like very useful. You want to take this if you have the if you can afford it. You can even take it on your state zeros to build them to expert states. Uh, 1k gold income is nothing to scoff at. Uh, pretty decent, pretty good, naturally. So because of that, it belongs uh, pretty in a pretty decent spot on the list, but not that high. Uh, because it's only uh, exclusive for comfy and it also requires gold to, to take, I would say it is BT. With a few downsides, but pretty good in general. Kind of like it. Actually, I think Fountain of You should be higher. Okay, then the Gem Pond. Gem Pond is an actual pond. I don't really know how gems are harvested or collected in the real world or in the game, uh, but the pond looks pretty cool. It's a nice looking objective, better than the Crystal Caverns, but worse than the Alchemist Lab nonetheless. There it goes, next to the other mines. But the gold mine though, wow! 1k gold per day. <clears throat> Taking this in the early game is gonna triple your income. You go from 500 to 1.1k uh, to 1.5k. Um, it's a very good way to build your economy and give it some lasting value over time. You know, in the cases where you go back and forth with an opposing player, um, you know, you, your uh, scout hero skill this and you kill them back and so on. It can give you that extra fuel to go on for like a little while longer. It's pretty important and pretty good. You should usually take this when you can. In the early days of your Somatic Venture Free PP gameplay, I used to say, well, these are actually not worth your time, but actually, I was wrong. I learned that. Um, gold mines are things that you should usually be striving to take. They're pretty good. They're really good, in my opinion. Next up is we have the... <clears throat> the Grave. This is a new wasteland object that gives you 500 to 5,000 gold and potentially an artifact deal. So this is usually a uh, ends up being as a low investment churchyard or a black tower, which is really good. A uh, very cool object gives your side hero something to actually do instead of wasting your time. Um, it's a one-time use scenario, so you basically consume it and that's it. But that's okay. It's a very nice cool objective. In my opinion, it is um, along the lines of uh, of a Derek. Not uh, perpetual use because of it's a one time, but more immediate gain. Cool. Next up is we have the Griffin Conservatory. Whenever you play PvP matches, I don't care what template you play, okay? You could play whatever template you want. This right here is the best object in the game. The most game defining, the most broken. The most angelic heavenly beings uh, thing that you can get. In here, you fight 50 to 200 griffins. And uh, per 50 griffins that you fight, you get one angel in return. And angels are like the best units in the game. So nice. Lightsaber attack. Feels good. Has extra morale. Doesn't ruin your uh, morale, uh, morale's army by getting them. Uh, is super fast. Uh, never dies. Great stats. Like these units are the best. Um, if you can stack up like quite a few of them off of these, then they are ludicrously good. But even if you have one, even one angel is gonna carry you like so so far. Um, th this is the best object in the game. Move aside, cryptographer. Angels are here. Yes. Next up is the hermit shack, a uh, complex volume exclusive uh, object that gives you that levels up one of your existing abilities. So if you have like basic wisdom and you take this, you could get to advanced wisdom or you could like level up a different skill. It's like a level up, except it doesn't give you the primary stat, but it also doesn't raise the XP requirement uh, for the next level up. It's decent for the early game. If you can pass by it, then it, you know, is a little bit of a shortcut to get your hero to a strong state. It's not bad. It's not great. It's somewhere in the middle. Next up is the Hillfort. Wow, the hill fort is, this is the old hill fort, premier hill fort, and it can upgrade your tier 7 units, and that's ridiculous, being able to cheat the upgrades of the best creatures in the game, and also being able to upgrade low tier creatures for like free, it is notoriously nuts, it is so good, 
it used to be overpowered it used to be banned in every single competitive competitive match um yeah this uh, thing was absolutely bonkers you don't really see the uh, you don't really see these these days anymore and that's probably for the better it's pretty cool sometimes you still see these in some exotic templates some you know unique uh, templates or maybe some maps uh, but for the most part, these don't no longer exist. But if they were to exist, then they would be definitely at the top of the list. Wow. Next up is we have the nerfed Hillfort. Now, what Ahura did to Hillfort is this. They no longer upgrade to 6 or 7 creatures. And they also um, cost double the price of a normal upgrade um, for every single tier of units. So yes, only upgrades to creatures 1 to 5 and a double the price of a regular upgrade. Um, that's a really good way to balance them. They are no longer your pretty much go-to building. You take this every time, you use it every time. Now it's more of, um, okay, do I need some units upgraded? Um, you know, I can cheat maybe like a turn of building in my town by taking this. It is really good on Rampart because they have, uh, they want to upgrade many creatures. Pegasi, Centaurs, Elves are all to be upgraded. So if they can cheat it in that kind of way, it's pretty good for them. It is very good when you're playing Annabelle and you can, uh, you know, cheat the upgrade for the pirates because their build path is like pretty bad. They have to build Blacksmith, they have to build the upgrade a few times. If you can cheat them with the Hillfort, it's actually way, way better. So yeah has some good uses, it's not that powerful, no longer a must-have in every single scenario. I feel like Hoda did a pretty good job at balancing this while keeping its thematics and making it still pretty relevant. Mm, pretty cool. Good job, Hoda. Uh, next up is the Seer... I mean, Seer's Hut. It is uh, everything that I said about the Eye of the Magi, still applies here. A very cool way to make the map a little bit more interactable with, give you like a little bit of a teaser, it makes the gameplay a slightly bit more interesting. That's nice. Having like a few miscellaneous things like that in your map makes it feel quite a bit better. Next up is the Idol of Fortune. In here, you get some luck. Okay. Next to the other luck objects, here you go. Not any exceptional, pretty bad. So, there it goes. Next up is the Imcash. This is another one of those early game objectives that you can take for a little bit of gold. Except as garbage. Now, personally, I feel like it's not as garbage as I claim it to be. Uh, many players are able to make pretty good use of these in the early game. Um, it is notoriously good when you're playing Necropolis and you want to slay a bunch of Vimps in order to get uh, some good Skelly going. Because you can actually fight up to like 300 Imps here, I believe. Um, yeah, and that provides sort of like really good skeleton growth. So yeah, when playing Necro, I like this as well. Uh, but usually it's not really rewarding. You fight like so many imps and it can be like a little bit hard to deal with. And, um, and you're doing it for like what? 1.5k gold? Two mercury? Really? That's the reward? After finding that many imps? Nah. Um, the fight hardness to reward ratio is not really good unless you're doing it later. But if you're doing it later, then, you know, it's not really that good of a reward anyway. So, yeah, it's pretty low. It is most usually just uh, used by Necropolis to gain skeletons, at least in my gameplay. Next up is the Ivory Tower. In here, you fight uh, Magi and Arch Magi in order to receive uh, mm, enchanters. And having a few enchanters, I mean, if you do one of these and you get enchanters, then that's really, really cool. Now, most usually you don't see these in most random templates. They're not available. But there's a few templates that makes use of this. Um, the most popular one would be Black and Blue, where one of the players collects skeletons and vampires. The other player collects genies and enchanters. Um, ends up being a pretty decent template. It was a fun playthrough the time that I did. Um, and yeah, the Ivory Tower was the backbone of the entire template. And, you know, whenever you're even in other uh, scenarios you encounter these, you usually want to take at least one of these because enchanters are really good value and their spellcasting ability is very, very nice. Uh, they are 8 there, at least, in my opinion. Next up is we have the Junkman. Uh, this spawns in the complex biomes and you can sell your artifacts in there, except they don't take scrolls, which is kind of bad because the scrolls are usually what you want to sell in the early game. Um, they're... Not that good. I almost never use them. Um, they're pretty hard to use because you have to chain your artists over there. And you don't really want to do that. Um, for the sake of like a few coins. 
Not to mention, you usually don't have the artists to sell. By the time you do, you can have an art merchants anyway. It's a pretty lackluster objective, in my opinion. Next up is we have the Tens. Uh, these belong alongside the Border Gods. Everything I said about the Border Gods applies to the Tens as well. They're used to gate players away from uh, certain zones on the map. They are a pretty necessary tool in terms of map making. It allows the template creators to control the places where the player is going. And yeah, they make good use of those and then maps are cool. Um, but it's not uh, like a very interesting thing to interact with. Next up is we have the Linties. Uh, Linties are actually the resource backbone of most of our gameplay. These, these things can generate you so many resources, by the way. Um, for anyone that is unaware, these uh, these things, uh, for one time only throughout the game, is gonna give you one to five of a random non-gold resource. Mm, pretty good! It's actually a pretty nice way to generate extra resources. Um, you, you know, your side heroes after chaining like for the first three turns are probably gonna be jobless uh, by the end of those. And uh, yeah, this is a way to give them something to actually do. Uh, pretty decent objective. Belongs in B tier, in my opinion. Next up is the Learning Stone. Wow, what an amazing thing. Uh, these are the ways that you level your heroes early. In case you don't really have like a well-defined main, you want to visit uh, the Learning Stone with lots of heroes to see what they roll, so you can make a better choice. Uh, these things are amazing. Um, if you get one spawning next to the road or next to your castle, all your heroes are going to be like higher level immediately into the game, which is very, very useful. Um, very cool object, very impactful in the game, um, spawns, I think, in all biomes, so, yeah, very, very nice. 8 S there. You want to see as many of these guys spawning next to your places as you possibly can. And next up is one of my favorite objects in the game, it is the library! This is a, a one-time consume per hero, and you have to be level 10. Uh, do you consume this or level eight if you have basic diplomacy six? Uh, I mean eight Six on advanced and four on expert I believe so yeah You can reduce the level requirement with diploma, but you don't really want to do that You just want to get to level 10 and take this and then you know, you're good. You're Gucci um, And it gives you plus two all primary stats And you know, there's a relic in the game called sandals of the saint um, that item gives you plus two to all uh, stats, and it's not that bad of a relic, it's kind of okay. And this one gives you that permanent relic without occupying uh, an item slot. Imagine if you collect a few of these, damn, that's really, really good. It is one of my favorite objects to take in a game. And you can build, like, ridiculous stat heroes, and the way those uh, ridiculous stats happen is through the access of library, most above all else. Next up is we have the... The magic springs. Um, this actually uh, is two vortexes, two matter vortexes. They take your current, no, they don't look at your current mana, they look at your max mana and give you mana equal to double of your max mana. So, yeah, that's really, really useful. And you can visit it twice a week. You can visit like the left hex and the right hex, and they basically are separate uh, magic springs. So that's two and one. So it's like two vortexes, really impactful. Spawns in uh, stronghold biomes, making them, you know, stronghold doesn't make that good use of them, but still is very impactful whenever you can use them. Um, they're really, really cool. I would put them in uh, eight there. Nice objects. Next up is gonna be the magic well. Magic Well gives you, recovers your mana up to full, can be used once per day per hero. Mm, really good. <clears throat> if you add them in a good direction, you can take a fight, take a Magic Well, take another fight locally. If they're on the way to your break in the Jeebus Cross, you're really happy because you don't have to stay in the base to, to get your mana back. Um, can be impactful, doesn't have to be impactful. It's a pretty good object that can spawn in any sort of biome. So... With that in mind, actually I don't know if any, I haven't seen one in the desert, but that might have been just the templates that I played. Anyhow, they belong in um, A tier, in my opinion. They're not much worse than Magic Springs, to be honest, because they can be used multiple times in a single week on multiple heroes as well. So they can accumulate quite a bit of value, and also they're more, they can spawn in more different types of zones as well. Next up is we have the Mansion. In here, you fight 40 to 120 vampire laws, and you get 
a certain amount of every single precious resource as well as some gold and a major artifact this is one of the worst resource banks in the game the fight that you have to take against the vampire laws is notoriously hard it's not easy whatsoever you have to do uh, you have to have a pretty great army a pretty great hero to be able to do this all uh, in the first place and for like what a major artifact and a little bit of resource no if i take that big of a fight i want a bigger reward this is one of the worst objects uh, in terms of like a reward to hardness fight ratio now like cyclone stockpiles these are one of the most effective ways to generate old resource so these still are relevant despite being this bad uh but still their badness does not get anything than c tier despite being somewhat relevant uh next up is melito tower one time visit per hero gives you plus one defense as a permanent stat pretty cool nice or good early way to build some stats um, they are not as good as Garden of Revelations, in my opinion, because Garden of Revelations enables your heroes to cast in the first place, which is a little bit better than, you know, just giving some stats over time. So, in my opinion, they're going to be pretty near Garden of Revelations, but a little bit worse. And we can actually do the Murkamp immediately as well. They're going to be better than the defense on average, but still worse than the Garden of Revelation knowledge. So, there we go. Next up is the Medusa stores. In this one, you fight 20 to 50 Medusas at random. Um, you know, 20, 30, 40, 50 in terms of tier. And then you get a gold reward as well as some sulfur. A pretty good way to build your economy. By the time you're able to do these, you should actually look to do these. Um, it will give you a pretty good chunk of gold. They're not too hard to do. They are rewarding enough to do. Um, yeah, pretty solid objects. Um, notably, they can kind of screw you over because if you have like a few tank uh, tanky units carrying you, they could potentially storm your tanky units and then focus your squishier units. So do be careful of that. I say that because, well, I had some unfortunate accidents in these uh, pretty recently. And they weren't very enjoyable. Uh, because of their res, despite them being, uh, them being not too hard, I would put them at B tier in my opinion. Uh, pretty decent uh, resource bank. Next up is we have the um, the conflict specific building that gives you plus 600 uh, movement points. 600! Oh my! And some morale. Now these things make getting around in the conflict zone that far much easier and better. It is actually really, really good. You should be looking to have these as often as possible. Whenever you pass by them, they're really, really good. 600 moon points is insane. Um, and yeah, these guys do a really good job in getting you to places. So with that, they actually belong in uh, A tier, in my opinion. Very cool. Uh, it actually makes conflict uh, zones like that much better. Next up is the Dancing Dudes. The Mystical Gardens gives you either 500 gold or 5 gems. Um, whenever you're playing Grasslands, you kind of, um, basically, you're going to have infinite gems because of these guys. <laughs> they spawn often, they can be taken once per week, um, and they always give you whatever you don't need. Whenever you're, like, missing a few gems to get to gain, um, you know, to be able to upgrade your Archangels or Titans, you're going to take a Mystical Gardens, and, you know, they're like 500 gold in a house, keep it, man. And whenever you want that 500 extra gold, and, um... Yeah, whenever you want that 500 extra gold to buy that extra hero to be able to do something pretty important, they're like, five gems, dude, okay? No problem, I got you. Five gems, here you go. So yeah, apart from being literally opposite of whatever you possibly want, uh, they're pretty good. They're decent. They belong in... Um, I feel like they are very much like the... Um, the Wasteland Windmill. Next up is we have the Naga Bank, the biggest of the resource objects. These are actually really, really good. And, um, yeah, what these do is you fight um, 8 to 20 Nagas, I believe. 
I could be wrong on the numbers. Anyway, they give you up to 16k gold and lots and lots of gems whenever you fight these. These are not that hard to take. And when we, whenever you get to the point that you can take these, you're going to be rich. Take a few of these and your gold is going to be ludicrously good. This is the best way to generate gold apart from dragon utopias but these have like a way lower entry point and barrier you also don't tend to bleed too much in these compared to utopias so they're really really good ways to build economy they are very important in the game um i would put them at s tier super the probably the best um resource bank in the game Next up is we have the Obelisk. This lets you find the Grail. Now, they're pretty cool. They're pretty interesting. You know, you can unlock the puzzle. You can find the Grail. You're going to be happy. But it's not that good. You don't want to be collecting like multiple Obelisks and sending your heroes out there. Uh, usually, uh, usually they're not a thing in PvP matches. And in PvE matches, you usually want the to let the eye find the Grail and just take it away from them. Yeah, just bully them. That's usually the better way to go. Uh, they're not very good. They are C2 in my opinion. But they're pretty cool. I like the cool aspect. So they will be not in the bottom at least. Next up is we have the Orpid. I can put the Orpid and Sawmill in the same place. That seems to be pretty intuitive. And these give you two ore per day or two wood per day. Um, And yeah, that's pretty good. They are not bad, they are your core way to get uh, the resources in the early game, and that is pretty impactful. Not as impactful as get generating the um, precious resources, because these uh, things are more abundant out on the map. And because of that, their value is not as high, so they would be at the bottom of Aether instead the, uh, of the mid tier of Aether, unlike the mines. Next up is one of the most exciting parts of Heroes of Might and free random map gameplay, okay? The Pandora Box! Now these, usually, unless they're tinkered with in some specific ways, is gonna get knit you um, one out of four outcomes. Um, two out of five times, you're gonna be getting experience from these. Really good, core way to build your uh, hero's experience. You usually want to take this on your main, and then you get a bunch of levels, and you're gonna be strong straight from the get-go if you get them up under a box. Uh, one in five times, you're gonna be getting spells. It, whenever you actually encounter an empty box in a random template, usually they're not empty, instead they're gonna be having spells. You either don't have the wisdom to learn the spells that they want to teach you, or you don't have, don't have a book. Then one out of five times, it's gonna be gold. Gold can be decent or bad based on your scenario. Usually you prefer other, better outcomes, such as one out of five times, you get army. Um, whenever you get army, you're actually really happy. The armies come in pretty great quantities and get you can get you rolling in the map. You can get like pretty nice things. Um, so yeah, those are the Pandora boxes and they are to be taken as soon, as fast as you can, as much as you can. Uh, they're very, very interesting. They're cool. The loot boxes of Euros 3. And to the top you go. Very cool object. Next up is we have the um, Pillar of Fire. This is the underground observatory for you. And yeah, it does a pretty good job. We may as well put uh, both the observatories next to each other. They immediately reveal a really big chunk of the map the moment that you encounter it. And you know, you use it. And that is a really great value. If you can see it on day one, then you basically can make a way better plan of what you can do. You, um, you know, you're able to play way better off the back of this object. It's very, very cool to use. It's very impactful. I would put it at S tier. Now, the underground one, though, is like way worse because um, the same number of um, map is going to have less value than that of the overground. The underground is just like a little bit less. And because of that, I actually believe it is the top of A tier instead of S tier, like the Redwood Observatory. There we go. Next up is we have the Pirate Caverns. Once again, a creature bank that is not commonly available in random maps. These are either in campaign scenarios or in um, other sort of places. And here you fight pirates and corsairs for the potential reward not, uh, of sea serpents. So you can cheat your way to sea serpents and that's pretty good. Not bad whatsoever. It's uh, really impactful. They are not that hard to take. The reward is actually really rewarding 
It's kind of a shame that we don't see these in other templates. Maybe we will in the near future. One of the only templates that I've seen this at is Empty Jeeba Small, which is made by Haystack. It's quite the meme template that has a lot of problems, <laughs> but um, yeah. The only refreshing part of it was uh, the fact that I saw this creature bang, which was pretty fun to interact with, honestly. And it can be probably implemented in pretty cool ways, so there we go. They go into A tier, I think um, somewhere alongside the workshops. A little bit, a little bit better. Next up is the prison! Wow! Uh, one of the most impactful objects in the game. Very similar to a Pandora box, actually. In here, you get uh, usually in randomly generated maps, uh, levels 1 to 30 hero. And in getting a level 30 hero, even if you rolls bad skills, is still going to be very impactful just due to the raw stats that the hero is going to be providing for you. So you can immediately get a powerhouse of a hero and you can also maybe chain prison to prison to do like a lot of objects in a single turn. Um, these are very, very impactful in very many PvP matches. And because of that, they belong at least in S tier. Really cool. Um, really nice. Uh, next up is we have this thing that I don't remember what it's called. Prospect or something? Uh, these are like the dancing dudes, except instead of potential gems, they give you potential sulfur. So they accomplish pretty much the same role, and they belong next to their counterpart. Next up is we have the Pyramid. In Pyramid, you fight a bunch of golems in order to receive a random tier 5 spell. You have to have wisdom in the first place to be able to learn the spell, and, you know, you have to fight quite a few golems. Most usually you're going to be learning Magic Mirror, but this can be impactful, but usually isn't it's not a very good object so because of that it belongs in the c tier in my opinion it's a pretty good reward and if you could generate this reward somewhat consistently that would be kind of decent but the problem with this is is that the hard difficulty to reward ratio is not very adequate uh find that many golems you cannot really do it in the early game that well and um because of that, I feel like it's not a very strong object and doesn't end up influencing many of the games. Next up is we have the Quest Guard. It's like the Border Guard, except you, uh, but instead of having to visit a tent, you have to do a specific quest. Maybe collect something, maybe kill something, and so on. Can be many different uh, things tied to the quest. I feel like they accomplish a similar role, but they're a little bit cooler, because actually accomplishing something or collecting something feels like it's more impactful than just visiting a tent. And because of that, they are a little bit higher than the border gate. Next up is we have the Rally Flag. A really cool object, gives you 400 moves, morale and luck for your next battle. Um, can be taken multiple times in a single turn if you take some fights, uh, can be used to build movement. Where if you have one next to the road, it gives your... Every single hero passing by, some extra movement, actually really impactful, very often seen, and uh, very well good, uh, usable. So because of that, I would say it belongs at least in A tier, but not as high as something like the 600 moves from the Confi, despite being seen a little bit more often. So there they go. Next up is we have the Red Tower. The Red Tower is also a pretty great object. Um, you fight fire elementals and, get, and you get fire birds. Usually, unlike the other creature banks, you don't really take these for the sake of a power stack. Instead, you take them as utility. Well, maybe you take them for the sake of taking some other range fight, like one or two phoenixes can cover range, uh, I mean, shooters, and then you can take them on without any problems. They can activate you to do fights that you otherwise couldn't have. A really good way to get going and really good in late game utility as well. A pretty solid creature bank added in Horn of the, Horn of the Abyss. I would say it belongs in low S tier. There it goes. Next up is the mercenary camp. What an interesting object. In this mercenary camp, you can recruit a week's worth of growth of a random unit. And that random unit can be really, really impactful. Uh, many call it the Archangel camp. Because like one in a thousand times you get an Archangel. <laughs> Yes, but when you do, it's a lot of fun. I had these a, a few times and it's been a glorious game every single time it happened. And even if you get some low tier units, you can use them as meat. If you get like some high tier units, even if they're like not the best, they're still pretty usable. Um, 
Very often, this gives you the, that extra tempo to get going faster and better. It is pretty impactful, it's pretty cool, it's very interesting. In my opinion, it is very lovely. Uh, there it goes. Next up is we have a resource pile. This, this crystal is representing any of the available resource piles, and actually the gold. And yeah, it's pretty good. Whenever you can take these, this is gonna build your economy. This is what your heroes collect all the time. Whenever they don't have anything to do, they just collect resources on the road. Um, to fight for a few resource piles is also a good idea in the early game to build your, you know, your resource stocks and so on for your mage guild or your happy units. Very impactful, very good. Take these. Next up is the ruins. Uh, ruins are very much like the corrupt, okay? You, in here, you fight a bunch of undead creatures in order to receive gold, but you get some vision extra, so you're able to know what's going on in the zone that little bit better. I would actually say they are better than the crypt. Usually as easy to take, not as rewarding in terms of gold, potentially, based on the sizes, and not doesn't give you items either. But the vision actually makes up for it, and they're really, really abundant in conflict zones. And because of that, I would feel I would say they're actually pretty good. Where if you want to play a decent comfy game, you should really learn to take these with your base comfy starting army. Next up is we have the Century. Ah, they're so boring. All they do is they prevent conflict. They let the uh, AI hide for like multiple times and PvP they're not useful at all. A uh, really boring object that just ends up impacting the game in less fun ways. Very much like the cover of darkness. It's only there to screw up the player. Next up is we have the Scholar. Uh, Scholar is pretty good. Um, they give you one of many possible outcomes. They can teach you a new skill. If you have the skill, they're going to upgrade that skill. If the skill is that expert, they're going to give you a random stat. They could potentially give you a, a teach you a spell. If you don't have the wisdom to learn the spell, they're going to teach you, give you a skill stat. Um, so yeah, they can give you a stat, a new skill, upgrade a skill, give you a spell, and also, they used to be pretty bad back in the days, because they would give you a skill and you couldn't refuse it. And over the abyss, you can refuse the skill, so they have no possible bad outcomes, but have lots of good, potentially, outcomes. So yeah, they're pretty good to take, you should take them on your main. Um, if they're not too far out of the way of the road, or where, wherever you're going on your main hero. Uh, pretty decent way to build your heroes. The skull belongs in ATM, in my opinion. Next up is we have the School of Magic and the School of War. They are very much like the Mercenary Camp, the Little Tower, except they cost gold. Um, and the addition of a 1k cost actually makes them a little bit less. So they go in beat there, both of them. Mm, one stat of your choice is pretty good though. Not bad, not bad. A pretty good way to build your heroes. Next up is we have the Sears Hut. Uh, this is where you complete your quests. Uh, this one hut is representing all the possible witches, by the way. They can spawn in different models as well, apart from this one. And yeah, they're like Pandora boxes, but with a few extra steps. But for the same kind of outcome, they would be having a way less of a... Um, they... Basically, in order to receive a 10, mag uh, 10 let's say, magical elemental box, you would have to fight uh, way more red dragons uh, than you would need for a quest item that would do the same so they are more value than the pandora boxes but they of course need you to find the rt the liberty rt so usually they end up being worse than the pandora boxes anyway but they're really cool like thematically they're so amazing right you go over you scavenge an item for them you deliver them back you get a pretty cool reward um very cool i love these guys I would actually put them at S tier in my list. Uh, very, very nice. Now, in most games, they actually end up being unimpactful. But despite being unimpactful, the possibility of them being impactful, and in the games where they do, they feel so good. I love these guys. So that's where they belong, at least in my list. Next up is we have the Shrines of Magic. First off, we have the Shrine of Level 1 Magic. This is usually what you build off of in order to get a pretty good spell pool for your heroes, maybe for your scholar, and so on. They're pretty powerful and you should collect these, they're pretty good. They are low beat there, I mean high beat there. 
Ah, pretty decent. I sometimes treat this as the rain, but I recognize that as a mistake that I'm doing. And I should be much more aware of these, and I should collect them more. Um, next up is the Shrine of Level 2 Magic. Level 2 has fewer good spells than Level 1 Shrines, actually, but they're a little bit more impactful. Lightning Bolt, Ice Bolt, um, and the Blind are the spells that you're looking for. Maybe Visions and some kind of Diplomat as well. They have less spells, less good spells available, so despite these spells that are good being a little bit more impactful, I would still say these Shrines are actually worse than the Tier 1 Shrines, but not by much. Not by much. Next up is the Tier 3 Shrine. Now, Tier 3 is the absolute dumpster tier of spells in US Mighty Mix 3. There's only basically two good spells for Tier 3, Anti Magic and Anime Dead. Um, but, um, yeah, they are usually, well, not usually are you looking for Anime Dead from Shrines, usually just built in the guild. And Anti Magic is like way late game, by the time you need it, you usually have it. So, yeah. These shrines are absolute garbage, you should almost never go for them, they are a plague upon this world, they absolutely suck. But their 4 shrine is where it's at! This can get your mages to a new level, um, if your early game mage is suddenly able to cast Chain Lightning, Meteor Shower, Resurrection, Town Portal, oh my god! All these options are absolutely stacked, Armageddon too, holy, these guys can activate you. To the point, I mean, can activate you to play the game in a way better way, just by itself, by existing. It is very, very impactful. Super great object. Um, A tier, in my opinion. I don't respect these as much as I should do, but they are real again. Next up is we have the sign. Uh, this is used by map creators to build the map a little bit more. Maybe instruct the players on what they are supposed to do and what scenarios, or maybe, you know, yeah, just for the sake of a little bit of world building. Um, not horrible they exist i guess next up is the skeleton transformer now skeleton transformer seems kind of good because you know it's a good building if we're necro so why wouldn't it be good externally well i'll tell you why because necro player is gonna have an internal in town skeleton transformer and non necro doesn't really want to use it anyway uh, back in the Shadow of Death days, you actually would want to use it because even as not Necro, Necro, Necromancer was so overpowered that you would build a Necromancer despite playing some other faction, and Scale Transformer could get uh, could net an easier way to actually transition to even more Necro. Uh, but in current modern day of Horn the Abyss, you never use these. They are pretty tragic, pretty bad, not used at all. Um, unfortunate um, fate for this uh, possibly cool objective. See there. And next up is the scroll for spells. Now, these can be anything from tier 1 to 5. Based on the size of it, it's going to be having a bigger god. And if it's a control spell, meaning that if it has town portal, dimension door, or fly, the god is going to be like that of a relic item. Really hard to take. Um, so yeah, scrolls are basically like shrines, but you can share with other heroes, which is actually a big bonus. Getting a few scrolls is gonna let any single new prison hero cast something. Um, gonna let your main cast something without visiting the mage guild possibly. And yeah, it's pretty high value. You should collect scrolls and you should build a pretty good casting base for your heroes off of these. Um, so because of that, they are 8 tier in my opinion. Next up is we have the spit. And here you find basilisks for some gold. Uh, they're not available in most maps, so uh, they are decently easy to take and they give you like a pretty good uh, gold reward. They're not bad, but not very impactful, not often seen, not well represented. They're kind of meh. They're kind of meh. Next up is we have the stables! Super exciting object! Now, imagine a scenario, okay, where you both start the map, you and your opponent, 1v1, PvP, and you take this on your on-road stables on every single one of your heroes, okay? You're gonna be getting 2800 extra moves across that week! Holy shit! It's gonna be like you're playing 9 days worth of gameplay, meanwhile the opponent's playing 7! Oh my! This object has the potential to be the most insane game-breaking thing in the entire game. It is so good! By the way, it gives you it gives your heroes 400 extra moves until the end of the week. 
super powerful whenever you can take this take this your main hero should always have this if you have a castle town you should build up the internal stables if you don't you should always use the external stables super impactful super great very very powerful um s tier easily objective wow uh there it goes next up is we have the star axis it is the worst out of all the free plus one stat uh, objects and uh, because of that, I would actually put it even below the school of magic, you know, the paid plus one stat ones. Um, they're pretty much the same, but like just a little tiny bit worse. Next up is we have the subterranean gate. Uh, this lets you traverse the map. It's a pretty necessary object. There's not much to say about this. You know, they're unnecessary part of the map, much like the other parts over here. They are the core way that you get around in uh, maps with underground. Next up is the Sulfur Dune. It belongs next to the other mines. Nothing much left to add. It looks uh, pretty good. Not as good as my favorite Merc Lab, but probably better than the Gem Pond and the Crystal Cavern. There they go. Next up is we have the most steaming hot pile of garbage in the entire game that the map actually has to offer. We have the Swan Pond! For the small price of all your movement points <clears throat> you can now have two no bonuses now okay the game it gives you like a little bit of luck but basically it's like no bonus for the small cost of all your movement points and that is not very good as you can imagine not very good whatsoever they are bad so bad in fact that like just having this is like worse than nothing existing never go here swamp ponds are bad Next up is we have the Tavern. It lets you recruit heroes externally, which is very potentially a good strategic benefit. If you're playing a Jeepers Cross and you have one next to your break, then you can actually poor man's your hero, basically retreat into any fight on like no army and then rebuy your hero in the Tavern. So you basically can portal over to the place that you want to, either into any town tavern or an external tavern too. So it's a really good way to get around for your hero and also can be a strategic benefit. Maybe if it's like um, next to your opponent, you can buy a, ta a hero off the tavern and then reach the opponent town just barely. You know, can used to be connect things that otherwise would not really be connecting. It's potentially really, really good. And um, yeah, in other scenarios, it's kind of garbage. It can be either one. It's very, very random, very wild. It's not that great, but it's pretty okay. Pretty okay. Uh, there it goes. Next up is we have the temple that gives you luck. Luck is not very good. Yeah, luck is not very good. So it belongs next to the other luck items. At least it doesn't consume all your moon points. So there we go. Next up is we have the temple of loyalty. It lets you mix army ties without losing morale. So, you know, if you have, like, um, Stronghold Army, Castle Army, Rampart Army, uh, you would be getting minus two morale from that because you're mixing two different types of armies next to your already one existing. That's, like, a pretty weird way to phrase it. Um, yeah, and in that case, uh, you know, when you have, like, three uh, army types, you would actually get plus two morale from this, and that's really good. Um, I usually treat this as terrain... But that's a mistake of mine. This is actually a pretty impactful, good object that you should always be taking if it's in your way or towards a certain fight. It will make your fights more consistent and better. Morale is a good stat. And this provides some morale. And because of that, it belongs in at least low A tier, in my opinion. Next, is, next up is we have the Down Gate. These are usually pretty heavily guarded, but if you can uncover one, then you have a way better way of getting around the map. And that is nice, really strong, really cool object. And because of that, I think it belongs at least in A tier. Not always used, um, gets overshadowed by the actual spell in the late game, but like in early mid game, it can be used uh, to pretty great effect. Nice. Next up is we have the town, just town. <laughs> it can be any town. This is representative of that, and of course, this is the core piece of gameplay of Heroes of Might and Magic 3. Without towns, nothing really happens, you don't get to build armies, you don't get to actually interact with things, they can't expand your reach on the map, at least as effectively, and so on. Uh, so, it is, well, kind of as impactful as it gets, right? 
So it is S tier. You want as many towns as possible. They will be your hubs off of which you can teleport, play, uh, take objects, and yeah, it's really, really cool. Next up is we have the trade marketplace. Uh, training post. Yeah, training post. Uh, this provides you with a way to trade resources at five marketplace worth of efficiency. So if you were to get more than five marketplaces in your kingdom, then using a trading post is actually going to get a net you negative efficiency. But before you get five marketplaces, the trading post is a really great way to get some efficient trades, either for the gold, uh, either trade your resources in the gold for more army, or trade the resources around a little bit. It's pretty useful. It's a great object. If you get it on day one, you almost always secure the possibility of getting eight heroes out on day one if you were to want that. And in many templates, you do want that. It is a very impactful object. It is A tier, in my opinion. Uh, very cool. Next up is we have the Trail Trailblazer. I haven't used this even once yet, okay? So I kind of have to go off of my head of how this will be. It makes your wasteland penalty go from 100%, I mean from 125%, to 75%. So you actually can walk on wasteland terrain and save movement points. And makes it cost less movement points to walk on um, wasteland than it would cost on grass. And it persists for the entirety of the week. I feel like this is a really great object. And it will make wasteland terrain actually very very cool um it's also like a very new concept to the game and i feel like it's a very good one i like this object a lot i can't wait to use it i feel like it will be very stables like and anything stables like is of course going to be high on my list there it goes next up is we have the treasure chest this is the core way that you get gold in your early game this is the core way that you get your few uh first level ups on your heroes and because of that, it is very easily, at least low S tier as well, a very iconic to the game, uh, back from the, ve the very foundings of Heroes 1. Uh, super iconic, super nice. I love this object. Next up is we have the, uh, the Tree of Knowledge. Tree of Knowledge um, at a cost of either nothing, 2k gold, and 10 gems is going to get you a level up. Um, it's gonna give you the amount of experience needed to go from your current level to the next level. Now, it doesn't take your current XP into account. It, take, it gives you like a flat amount of that level. Like on level 13, you're gonna get that much XP. On level 15, you're gonna get that much XP. So if you're like at near a level up, it doesn't actually matter that much if you level up before getting that little bit of XP. You, It's like a very small difference, so you don't have to worry about that. Mm, usually it's like really, really good. Um, if you get like a free Garden of Revelations next to your road, then, then, then you know, building a bunch of heroes is like pretty cool. Um, also, in the late game, when the uh, levels are far less available because of the ludicrous amounts of experience you need to get to level up, these guys become invaluable in building those super late game heroes. So yeah, it's a pretty cool object. Um, it's not as impactful as the Learning Stone, I think. Because the early game usually matters more than the late game, in my opinion. At least in the PvP matches that I play. So, yeah. They go in the 8th tier, at least, in my opinion. Next up is we have the... Gateways. The Swan Gateways are representing every single gateway. Um, one way exit, um, two ways, one ways, uh, so on. And they're like a necessary way to get around, but they're kind of a garbage way to go, go around. Whenever the maps are connected in ways that are not the portals, it makes it far easier to understand where and what is going. When there's a lot of portals, it makes a lot it makes for a lot of confusion, like what goes where, it's pretty yeah, hard to track. Um, killing the eye is a pain if there, there's like a lot of portals leading to them. Um, so yeah, most usually maps are better without these, but of course they are many times necessary. And, um, you know, an evil necessity, I would say, belongs in the seat there. There they are. Next up is we have the university. University is really, really cool. It, it has four random skills, and then the random skills are can be bought by any visiting hero for 2,000 gold. 
this can be a really really good way to find a specific skill that your hero is not likely to get for example you could be rolling with a knight main because you know maybe you want orange archery specialty but you're not really likely to get earth magic which is pretty essential to the game so you could actually look for it in a university instead and just learn it that way for example so yeah getting some new skills that the heroes are not very likely to get is a pretty good usage of the university and you know mm, pretty good decent object it, there, it's nothing that special but um it's pretty useful top of b tier in my opinion next up is we have the wagon and here it's another kind of object very much like the skeleton we can get some arty or resources uh it's something your side heroes um Something that will be taking up your side heroes' movement points and their time, so they can actually be useful instead of being wasted. Um, a pretty good thing for them to... I mean, a pretty w good way to use up your side heroes. I like wagons. I very often get like pretty good items from these. Uh, very usable, very nice. It is very cool. Next up is we have the every single warehouse, and I'm going to be treating them immediately. Uh, warehouses are going to be guarded more so than the... Um, then the resource piles, but these can be visited multiple times and they always give you a certain amount of resource, which is going to be six, I believe. Uh, six for the precious resources, ten for non precious, and 2.5k for gold. Um, or 2k. I'm sorry, <laughs> the exact amount sometimes get a little bit fuzzy. All of these are pretty good holy editions. Um, they are an extra object and that can spawn on the map. It makes the map a little bit more uh, varied. And they are a very solid way to build your resources. When you need something, you can just visit um, a warehouse and you're going to be good to go. All of these belong in about low beat there. They're nothing special. They're pretty good. Um, not as impactful as the resource piles because there's way less of them, but whenever you get them, they're pretty good. Uh, notoriously, gold is really, really good because, you know, getting like that much gold just straight up like that is, is kind of good. So they belong in high beat there, in my opinion. Meanwhile, the ore and the uh, wood kind of belong next to these. There they are. Next up is we have one of the most nuts additions with the new terrain wasteland. This is a wasteland objective that also got added in the snow. It is the Warlock Alchemist Lab. Warlock? Alchemist? Um, anyway. In here, you can transmute resources. One to one ratio. One precious resource into another. Okay? So, you're wanting to build your Titan Power Stack. You have, like, uh, 20 gems, 30 sulfur, um, 30 um, mercury. Okay? Well, how about those 30 uh, sulfur and mercury become gems oh wow now you have 80 gems oh wow easy titans enjoy holy so powerful for building specific uh late game units and so powerful for building a mage guild your resources whenever you have uh, access to this object uh, the, your resources become a single pile and you can transmit them to whatever you need at the moment very insanely good super strong um, of course, they're not valuable in every single scenario, but for scenarios that they are valuable for, um, this item, I mean, this object is the nuts. Super good. It was so good, in fact, it had to get nerfed, uh, very soon after getting added. They made the guards for this, uh, object a little bit harder. So now they're not as easily accessible anymore, but still worth fighting for. There they go. Next up is the War Machine Factory. It's very much like the Cannon Yard. You usually don't want to buy the War Machines. You want to get them like alongside other heroes. Or maybe you're going to be building one of, out of your main. Like going all the way out of your way for the sake of the War Machine Factory is usually not a very good idea in my opinion. Uh, so because of that, they belong in Cite. Next up is we have the Watering Place. This gives you a really good chunk of moves. They spawn in um, stronghold biomes and they make uh, getting around the stronghold biomes way, way better. Now, these take up like a pretty good amount of uh, space on the map so they can actually block 
things from you. They can also be like a little bit uh, awkward to access because you have to go from the, to them from like the uh, right or the bottom. So if you're they're below your road, they're kind of hard to use a little bit sometimes. Uh, but still, gaining extra moon points is never to be underestimated in Heroes of Mind and Magic 3. They're pretty good. They're pretty good. I do like them. 600 moon points is a lot. So they belong in A tier, in my opinion. They're about the Rattle Flag, honestly. Um, they're a little bit more awkward than the Rattle Flag, but they're more impactful than the Rattle, than the rattle Flag. And speaking of movement, we have another very unique object. We have the watering place. Uh, the watering place. Wait, I call this the watering place. Uh, I don't remember what this uh, is called. Okay, sorry. Um, but this is gonna consume the remainder of your moon points for the day. But as an outcome, it's gonna give you one thousand extra moves on the next day. So you can set up heroes with a ludicrous amount of moves. It lets you reach places that otherwise would be way harder to reach. It is just a very big solid bonus all around that you should be exploiting as much as possible whenever you get this one in your zones. A very super great object. And because of that, they belong in the S tier. They're very much like a trailblazer, but you know, pretty distinct from one another, nonetheless. And next up is we have the watering wheel. We already rated the watering wheel of the wasteland. So they are the same as the watering place. I mean, as the um, watermill of the wasteland. So there they go. They get 500 gold on the first week. Uh, uh, 500 gold on the first week and uh, 1000 gold on the second week. And this basically gives you a side hero something to do after they are no longer used in chains. There they go. Speaking of using side heroes, windmills are also collected by side heroes to generate some extra resource. And usually those extra resources are worth a little bit more than the watering mills. But these are guarded far more often than the water mills. And because of that, I feel like they deserve a little bit of a lower, lower rating. Because they are less available and you have to invest more effort into getting these than the other ones. There they go. Next up is the Witchhot. The Witchhot is going to be able to, to teach your heroes a new skill, random new skill. And that skill can be anything. And uh, yeah, if you want to, you can go visit it and you can get the skill. If you have like a Logistics Hut or a Nerf Magic Hut, these can be very impactful in your games. But most usually is not that impactful. It's a very kind of wild card objective. I would say it belongs in low B there. And last, but most certainly not least, we have the Wolf Raider Picket, a new Hoda edition creature bank. You fight Wolf Raiders in these. 50 to 150 Wolf Raiders will net you 4 to 150 Cyclops. And that's really, really powerful. You end up... Uh, with a really good range power style, the moment you do these, and you can stack up quite a few of them as well. You know, they are very abundant and randomly generated maps. And because of that, they're one of the defining ways that you play the game. They are super impactful, very good, not too hard to take. Um, they are core base of the gameplay and one of the abyss to this day. Um, very cool. So they belong in S tier, in my opinion, probably above the lamps. So yeah, there we go. This is my tier list for the adventure maps uh, available. I mean, for the adventure map objects available in Horn of the Abyss. So let me know what you think. And um, I'll be seeing you guys next time. Uh, for tomorrow, I have a shorter tier list in mind of what I want to do. And for the days after, I'll be starting to, to make the template showcases. Where I will present you with the templates that we play in online matches. What they're all about, what are the general strategies there, and so on. So, hopefully I'll see you then. Bye-bye. Till next. Also, watch my stream. In I stream like every day. It's in the description.